Okay, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I know we have uh, some Kiwis who have come joining across the ditch this afternoon and I think it definitely counts as evening for you. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, or if you're watching the recording, thank you for taking the time to learn uh, along with us today. We know that um, everybody in education would like more time in their life and so we are always very appreciative when uh, you choose to spend your time uh, learning with us. Uh, this afternoon we are going to be talking about um, all things um, data and assessment um, uh, with different Google tools and we have a couple of um, wonderful uh, reference schools. Google reference schools are going to share some of their experiences with this as well. Uh, and uh, as I have said at the start, please do feel free to use the chat to ask any questions throughout. Um, if you are watching the recording uh, in the calendar invitation where you found the recording, you'll also find a document which has the transcript of the chat from the uh, Meet call. So if you are ever wondering, we'll try and read any questions aloud so we can address them. You don't have to troll through that, but uh, you can obviously go back to that as well. Um, before we get into the content for um, today's session, uh, I did just want to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which, um, well, I am joining you from. I know we have some people in New Zealand, but uh, all Australians are. Um, and for me, I'm in Melbourne, beautiful, sunny Melbourne today with pouring rain. Uh, and so the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and we pay our respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging, uh, and also recognise their continued connection to the land and waterways. And wherever you are joining us from, I would encourage you to do the same and just take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land um, on which you are currently residing. Uh, so my name is Kimberly. Hello, if we haven't met before, um, I am from Melbourne. Chris says you, you always know I'm from Melbourne because I tell everybody I'm from Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne. 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 Uh, and I uh, do work in the Google for Education demo as a teacher and then um, worked in the Catholic Education Office. And Chris and I did a whole lot of professional development all around the world, actually, for a few years together before starting at Google. And I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Chris. Do you want to say hello? Hi everyone, good to be here today. I'm talking about one of my favourite subjects, which is data and spreadsheets and numbers. And consider I'm not really a maths person. I don't, I'm surprising I like spreadsheets as much as I do, really. You really do like spreadsheets. <laughs> They're magical. Yeah. So uh, as as Chris says, it's interesting. You said data. I always say data. Anyone in the chat, feel free to weigh in. Which if we have to, we're just probably going to say it differently the entire yeah. afternoon. So sorry about that for everyone. Um, uh, so this afternoon, uh, we also are going to be joined by two very special guests. Um, so we have Mitchell Gibbs joining us from Gorakin Public School in New South Wales. And uh, Gorakin is one of our excellent reference schools across New South Wales, part of the Department of Education's uh, Google experience up there for me. Uh, and then we also have Jason Hager from Murray Bridge High School uh, in South Australia. Uh, and Murray Bridge are another one of our reference schools doing all kinds of really cool stuff um, with data. Uh, and so we asked these guys to come along today and share some of their experiences, um, some of the things they're doing that have worked well, any learnings to share as well. Um, before we jump into that, though, um, we are going to be, Mel B's joining, she's just Spice Girls. Um, uh, we are going to be uh, covering off the following things in today's session. So we're going to look at uh, just briefly, we won't spend a lot of time on it because we know that most people hopefully are pretty familiar with forms. Um, but if there is anything specific around forms, we'll um, definitely jump into that for you. But Chris has built some pretty amazing demonstration forms um, to talk about different types of questions, so collecting data with forms. Um, then um, Chris is definitely going to geek out about spreadsheets and share some of his uh, top tips and most useful uh, formulas and fancy thingamabobs that involve some duba wackies um, in spreadsheets to make your life easier. Uh, then we are going to hear from our special guests and there will be time at the end for questions. Once again, please ask questions throughout at any point. We are happy to deviate from whatever it is that we are talking about. Uh, so we did want to start today's session just uh, talking about um, collecting data using forms. And um, it's interesting, Chris and I were talking about when we were planning this session, 
we were saying how, you know, it went, I remember when I started teaching almost 20 years ago, the like collecting data on students was like this big thing and everyone was talking about, oh, we need to do a better job of collecting data. And I feel like in, in education institutions uh, across the world, we've got pretty good at collecting data on students. We're not necessarily good at collecting the right data or collecting it in the right format that then makes it usable. And what we're seeing a lot of is um, schools that have this, the absolute plethora of data that is collected on students, but they're not really sure how to process that data in ways that actually makes it usable and accessible um, and, and valuable to them as an organisation. And so that's what we want to sort of touch on this afternoon. So we are going to jump over to forms. Chris, could you do, could you, while I'm jumping into forms, or you could talk if you like, and I could do this, could you create a little poll and just gauge um, people's sure. understanding of, um, uh, you know, zero to five on yeah, how let, comfortable let, let they feel yeah. okay. about forms? So Chris is going to create a poll no, in the meeting. Actually, I can't because you're the meeting owner. Okay, do you, you, you want to take over sharing screen and I'll do that quickly and just sure, start yeah. with going through the your first of your example forms? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let me just, um, sorry, you caught me off guard there. Let me sorry. jump into this webinar on this machine. Okay, so as Chris is doing that, um, we will put these links that are on the screen right now in the chat as well, but these are two um, the two forms that I referenced that Chris has created, which are phenomenal examples of the power of different types of questions um, within forms for collecting data. So we will start with the one bit.ly forward slash what's with all the questions uh, or lowercase. Uh, uh -huh. I'll, dro I'll drop that link in the chat if you want to have a look at it, um, play along live or uh, obviously after the fact as well. But Chris, are you uh, ready to take over? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just finding the meeting link. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry. Uh, where is it? Ah. Sorry, Kimberly, I wasn't expecting Sorry, that. I know. Here, let me jump in here. We didn't really think through the fact that you couldn't create polls <laughs> when we were talking about it earlier. That's uh, right. Show of hands. That's, that's easy. That's right. Um, so this is... Um, this is the form that we were I was referencing. So uh, bit.ly, what's with all the questions? I'll copy that and drop it in the chat now as well. And basically what Chris has done here is, um, and I believe he did this one night when he was should have been binging Netflix like um, <laughs> everybody else. Uh, he decided to create a form that basically captures all the different types of questions available in forms. And um, the idea of this to, is to help to think about what is the right question type to help you get data in a way that's going to be most impactful and most useful for why you're collecting data. So as everybody is aware, and you can obviously have a look at this on your own computer as well, there are a whole range of different uh, question types within forms. Um, and uh, we just what this is uh, the idea of this is just to think about maybe how we could use some of those question types a little bit differently. So, Chris, do you want me to keep going? Uh, I can jump in with the, with a live form. Is that what you want me to do? Um, sure, if you've got it right there. Or I can. You want me to talk about this one? Oh, whatever you like. <laughs> okay, um, this is why we plan. <laughs> <laughs> We did plan. We actually did plan this, believe it or we not. Did, we did. We, did we just then we're just deviating from the plan, so <laughs> we should stick to the plan that we plan. All right, I'm just going to jump in and take over your screen for a sec. Okay. All right. Uh, we did that. We did that. We did this. Okay. All right. So I'm just jumping into forms here. I, I guess the thing I want to point out, having worked with lots of teachers making forms over the years, um, I think we all have our favourites. Um, so, you know, once you've learned to make forms, that very first time you go to a workshop and someone shows you how to make a form and you go, oh, that's pretty easy. And then you kind of tend to, a lot of teachers tend to stick with two question types. They choose the multiple choice question type. Right, too many computers open. Multiple choice question type right here. Or they use the short answer and maybe sometimes a paragraph. And those are the kind of the, the popular three that people tend to use. And I, I don't know, there's this kind of, reticence amongst some people to sort of look further down this list because they start to look complicated. What's a multiple choice grid? What's a, what's a checkbox grid? What's that all about? Linear scale, that sounds scary. So like sometimes I think people don't use these other question types enough, even though they're probably question types that give you better data for what you want to do. So, you know, I think we're all familiar with multiple choice questions where you can come in here and, you know, add uh, and other, other things in there, you create as many options as you want. Um, then you've got the other type, which is the checkbox question, where you can have 
you can select as many of them as you want. Multiple choice is only one. Isn't that weird? It's called multiple choice, but you can only make one choice. It's multiple choices. You yeah, decide but it's like multiple on multiple choices one. question. It's got... <laughs> anyway, so the, the way it works, if it's got a checkbox in a square, it, you can select lots of them. If it's got a uh, checkbox in a circle, you can only select one of them. That's the easy way to remember. Um, so look, creating multiple questions, you just click that little button on the side there, choose your question type, linear scale. These are great for when you've got like, I want to, I want to gauge something on a scale of one to five or on a scale of say one to 10 or a scale of one to whatever you want, right? So, and you can label one end of it, well, this is bad and that would be good. So you can label them. And so you can create these sort of uh, like a like it scale um, type thing. One of my favorite question types though is the one that a lot of people tend to avoid and that is, okay, the next one here, is this one called a multiple choice grid. And it gives you rows and columns and when you, when you get those rows and columns, it, uh, it actually puts one against the other so you can compare things. Now, let me jump over to my other form and I'll try and show you what that means. So this is the form that Kimberly was talking about before. I'm just going to sort of zoom in a bit on that so I make it bigger. So what I did with this form, is I just made a, an example using the 11 different types of questions. And I made an example of each one and then a few other random examples as well. So if you want to see all the question types in action, uh, you can just come here and have a go at this. Um, feel free to borrow it if you need a copy of the original one. If you email me, I can probably try and find that for you. But the the so this, for example, multiple choice. You can see I can select Peru or France, but not both. Down here, you've got I can do swimming and hiking and eating out. I can do, uh, and I've put a limitation on that one. I can only select two. So you can actually put some limitations around these. Um, there's a drop down answer there. Drop downs are great when you've got lots of choices. That you don't want to clutter the screen with in a multiple choice. Um, this is the, uh, the the scale one I was talking to you about on a scale of one to ten. But if I come down to here, this is the um, the multiple choice grid thing that I was talking about, where you can have a list of things down one side and a list of things across the top, and you create that grid where you can say, well, travel broadens the mind. Do I agree or disagree? Yes, I strongly agree with that statement. And so. I think that's a really powerful question type. Now you can put some restrictions on some of these question types too, where you have to choose something in a column and you have to choose something in a row. And when you do things like that, you can actually do things like, for example, a matching exercise. One of the question types we don't have in Google Forms is a matching exercise. And when most people say that, they think about the idea of dragging something to something else. And we can't have that yet. We don't actually have that question type, but you can get the same result here by putting the two matching things top and bottom or top and side and then simply saying well Indonesia would be Jakarta, Thailand would be Bangkok and so on. So you can do your matching that way uh, and then putting a restriction in place that says down here you can see it says this question requires one response per row. So you can actually sort of make matching type questions if you want. This is the same kind of thing but again they're boxes, they're squares so you can tell that that's going to give you uh, you can have multiple choices in each one. I'd like to dine in Japan and New Zealand and the Philippines, for example. Okay, so that kind of thing, um, dates and times and all sorts of things. Now, if you go to the next page on this quiz, this uh, this form, it will actually, uh, yes, all right, we want one per row. It's forcing me to do this. As you're feeling that in, Chris, I yep. did launch a couple of polls just to get people's pulse on uh, forms and uh, uh, favorite yeah. question types and how confident you are mm -hmm. using them. So if you are joining us live, uh, please feel free. You should see uh, in the top right hand corner, unless you've got the new user interface in Meet that I don't have yet, which you might have better than me, uh, you should see a little dot above um, the uh, activities, little triangle, square, circle. Um, and if you go in there, you should see some live polls that you can vote on. Don't feel you have to, but if you haven't tested out Meet polls before, it's a good opportunity to see the way they work as well. Nice. Now, I've just gone on page two of this form too, and just to, just to show you here, like you can put pictures in. So this is an example, you ask, a, you show a picture and then ask some questions about it. You can have other examples where the questions become the things you choose or you can have examples where you show someone a video and then from the video you ask some questions about it afterwards, so pictures and images. So there's lots and lots of things you can do inside forms. Um, and so yeah, go, go to that example and have a bit of a poke around, have a play with it, see different examples. And if you want, there is also, uh, if we go back to the main front page of that, there's also a link here to a second one called self-marking questions. As you, you might know, you can use Google Forms to create a quiz and make it self-marking. 
And I've given you some examples in this one, again, of all the different types of questions that can be self-marking. So for example, a text question with text answers, text question with image answers, image question with text answers, and so on and so on. So every every um, combination that I could think of to throw in there, uh, I did throw in there. And so you can hopefully get an idea about what's possible with asking multiple choice, sorry, uh, asking quiz type questions with a form. Awesome, thank you, Chris. And um, it's interesting, I just put in the, like, what's your favorite question type in forms? And multiple choice is definitely winning, but we've got two others as well. And if anyone wants to drop in the chat what the question type that their favorite is, because I just put in multiple choice, choose from a list, short answer, paragraph. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want to put in what your favorite question type is in forms in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, Chris, I think one of the really cool things about the this, uh, these example forms that you're showing is that, yeah, there are all these different ways of gathering different types of data. But um, I think to the point, uh, and, and obviously keep conscious of the time as well, to the point that we were talking about before, once I gather the data, you know, I think having it in a spreadsheet and being able to read it and actually use it are uh, very not necessarily connected concepts yeah. uh, in the way that we actually work. So having collected data inside a form, and we haven't really even touched on quizzes. Quizzes is this gear wheel here, and you go over to quizzes and flick this little switch, and you can make it into a quiz. We're not really talking about quizzes today, but like you can do that. That's how you do it. We're talking more about using forms not for quizzing necessarily, but data collection. Okay. So you um, can um, actually, by the way, just as a PS in Drive, you can go when you go to make a new form. Now you actually have the choice of making like a standard form. I don't think they call it standard, mind you, um, oh. or or a quiz form. Um, in Drive, you can do that now. Yeah, in Drive, you need a little arrow, blank Ooh. form or blank quiz, or choose from a template. So oh, and when you when you do blank cool. quiz, it just basically um, like Chris just showed you the switching the quiz mode on. It just automatically goes in with that switched on, and then it will prompt you to put your answers in and things like okay. that as well. There you go. I haven't, I haven't got that one yet. All right, mm. good to know. Um, I did want to just point out in here though that when you create your quiz, oh, sorry, sorry, I keep saying quiz. When you create your form, um, you've got the option on this tab up here to collect the responses. And as people responded to this, it will be collected here. But this little green button here creates a spreadsheet that's attached to the form. So as the as the information is being collected on the form, it comes automatically in here to the spreadsheet. And so, you know, I think creating a form and having a few spreadsheet skills go hand in hand because once you once you just have a few skills with the, um, the spreadsheet, you can actually manipulate that data to, to really extract a lot more meaning from it. And I guess that's what we really want to talk about today is once you've got the data, whether you've collected it directly in a sheet or via a form, doesn't really matter. It ends up in a sheet. Then what do you do with it? How can you manipulate it to sort of really, you know, look at what it's trying to tell you, what that data is trying to tell you? Yeah, absolutely. And do you want to maybe let's jump in. If there's any specific questions, please drop them in the chat. But Chris, you want to jump into the spreadsheet? Sure. Um, sure. Christy's just said that her favourite question uh, question type in forms is the tick box, tick box grid. Um, and I was saying that, you know, I probably should use it more, but my, I've definitely, my, the English teacher in me often defaults to like open text field questions, which are not as easy to then manipulate the data uh, in spreadsheets. For sure. Now we've got uh, two very special guests going to talk later in this session. Uh, we've got Mitch from uh, Gorakin, and we've got Jason from um, Murray Bridge. And, and they are going to show you some real world examples of how data is actually being used in their school, how they're collecting it, and what they're doing with it after they collect it. Now, some of the stuff you're going to see from those two is we, we try to give you a range of things from something that's pretty achievable by anyone and something that's fairly aspirational. You look at it and go, oh my goodness, how did they do that? Right, and, and we don't want to scare you off. So I just want to just spend a few minutes showing you some really simple examples of things you're about to see later on that might look complicated, but if you've seen a simple example, hopefully it might just demystify it a little bit and it won't quite seem so unattainable, okay? So some simple examples that you'll see complex implementations of in just a few minutes. Right, here I've got a class list. And I've got some students here that have, you know, submitted some work. So it's a couple of standard kind of things I'd want to do with this as a teacher. The first thing I'd do is obviously want to know what the total is. And most of you probably are aware that you've got this little formula thing up in the corner here where you've got to do standard formulas. The most, the, I call these ones the, the big five, sum, average, count, max, min, because they're the ones that like, if you can just do these five, you can do so much in a spreadsheet. Now that said, there are actually hundreds and hundreds of formulas you can use. 
Most of them probably seem complex, so don't get put off by them. If you can just do the top five, some average count max min, which actually all work pretty much the same way, you can do an awful lot in a spreadsheet. So I'm just going to add up these scores. So I'll put my cursor inside that box there. I'll click my little button up here and say sum. And then it says, well, what do you want to sum up? I want to sum up these things here. And I press enter. Now we've got this great new feature in Sheets where, you know, I've added up the top row. Sheets is smart enough to figure out that you probably want to add up all the ones below it as well. So it's suggesting here, do you want me to fill this in for you automatically so you don't have to do it? Yes, please. Click that and it's just done for me. So that's a nice little feature as well. The other thing that teachers do a lot of is work out percentages. So, you know, simple calculation. Just so happens these three tasks are all out of 35. So it's a total out of 105, but I need it out of 100. So I need to do just a little bit of maths here by saying make this equal to whatever the score is divided by 105, not 100, right? And so you can do that. It works out the, uh, the percentage there for you. That's great. I'm going to fill all of that down there like that. So I have all my percentages. Fantastic. So I'm very happy with that. That's good. Now, down here, you've got your averages and your maxes and your mins, and I won't do it for you in the interest of time, but what I, what I would normally say to teachers, like, work out what's your average for, for, that, um, for that task? What's your average for this task? What was the maximum minimum scores? And it's exactly the same as I did for the, uh, for the sum there, except instead of choosing sum, I'd choose the word average. I'd select the numbers that I want to make the average of, press enter, and it works out the average for me. Then I can, of course, take that and bring that across and I get all my averages, right? Won't do the others, but you get the idea. That's the way you can at least dig into the data a little bit. Now, can I just know something, Chris? Um, one of the things that I like about, um, you know, like all the little help boxes that come up, even like the suggested auto fill yeah. box that came up for you, you'll notice, like, see there, the blue learn more. Yeah. I really like that in spreadsheets so that if you wanted to, you know, this is, as Chris said, you know, these are the auto sums, so they're doing the hard lift for you around what the formula is and stuff that if you wanted to delve into it you've got that option and actually it will show you the formula and then you can actually go off and also you know learn more and, and ultimately you know we probably want to be learning some of those basic formulas and, it, and it's it's sort of prompting you if you want to yeah absolutely now the thing about numbers like this, and you probably you may have heard me say once once before in a webinar that you know it, it, seeing numbers without a way to visualize the numbers is like seeing musical notes without a way of listening to them, right? We need to be able to visualize the, this information in order to really extract meaning from it. So one of the first things I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the tasks, not the totals, just the tasks themselves. And I'd like to color code these. So in other words, if a student's done really well on a task, I'd like to see it in, say, green. And if they've done poorly, maybe I'd like to see it in red. So I can do that pretty easily. I've got a, a little feature up here in the format menu called conditional formatting. Now, the word condition means, you know, there's a condition attached. If, if something is the case, then do something else. So the condition here is the value. So I'm going to turn on this conditional formatting. And I'm going to go, now I can do it all manually, but I'm going to pop over to this thing in the corner that says color scale. And you can see what it's got here is it's automatically done a color scale for me. Now, right now it's a bit back to front because it's showing me the darker green is in the low scores and I'd really like it to be the other way around. That's okay. I can just click on this thing and it'll give me some other options. So I'm going to actually go, uh, I'm going to choose this one here from red to white to green. If I choose that one now, I can see that the scores that are low, like these 13s and 12s here, it's an 11, like they're in red and the scores that are good, like 35 and 34 and the higher scores there, they're in green. So instantly I can look here at Tamika Hawk and see she's red all the way across. So I have a problem there. And this Molly Collin, a collie, she's done pretty well because she's mostly green. So I'm getting a pretty good idea here. If I look down the column and I can see that there's a lot of red in task one, as a teacher, I'd think to myself, maybe I need to go back and reteach some concepts there because that's obviously a fairly poor performance in that task. So the color coding, simple color coding can actually tell you a lot as well. The other thing you might want to do is um, uh, on, on the, let me just say done to that, accept that. I might want to also take these percentages here and flag any students that need special attention. So for example, in their total score, not their individual task, but their totals, I might want to go over here and um, let's add a rule to that one. And let's say that if the cell if the score in the cell is less than or equal to, say, 50, uh, maybe I'd like to see that in red because maybe I need to do something about that. 
oh, sorry, uh, 50, was it not? No, uh, 50%. Do I have to? 50%. There you go, better. Okay, so you can see it's highlighted here for me all the scores that were below 50%. So I can really easily see at a glance, okay, I need to go and speak to these students. They're obviously having some trouble. So that's just a little bit of color coding. I'll pause briefly for any questions on that. And I'll switch over to the chat. No questions yet, Chris, no questions. but I, I okay. think this, um, oh, something just came in. I think the, um, the colour coding for me was something that I used um, uh, all the time because I, I am not like you. <laughs> I don't get quite as geeked out by spreadsheets because I don't, my, my skill level, I don't feel as confident in them. But yeah. some of this conditional formatting just makes, made like, was, is such a, a simple way to change the way that my, my you know, student spreadsheets looked. Now, I'm, I'm going to show, I, I was going to show you three things here. I've just showed you the first one, which is that color coding, right? Uh, the next two are uh, maybe a little bit crossing into geeky territory, but stay with me, right? And then the fourth thing is a little bonus. So here's the second thing. It's called a drop down list. I want to have a list here where all my students can appear in a drop down. Now, I've actually got the list here. You can see my students here, right here in this list. They go from cell A2 all the way down to A14, right? What I'd like is to create a little drop down here that I click on this and all my student names appear. Let me show you how to do it. It's actually called a thing called data validation. So I'm going to select the cell that I want my list in, go to the data menu and say data validation, right? And it asks some questions here, but basically it says, where, where do you want to get these names from? Well, you've got a few options. You can put it manually type in a list or whatever, but I want to list them from a range. They already exist. So I'll click on from a range and then I'll go and find them. So now if I, actually, if I click on this little box here, it'll put me into hunt mode and I can go back to my class list and just simply highlight the names. And you notice what it's done here is actually put in here from the class list tab, I want A2 to A14 those lists. When I say OK and save that, now when I go back to this drop down, you see that this is now a little arrow in the corner and now that becomes a drop down list. So if I want to pick a student to put into that box, I can simply select them from this list just like so. OK, now that's not too hard, right? It's just called a data validation. Now, the next step from having a data validation is to say, well, OK, I've selected Natasha Johns's name from the list. Can I look up Natasha Johns's scores and put them next to her name on here? And the answer is yes. Let me just show you how you do that. So I've actually done it here for you because it, it uses a thing that I don't want you to be put off, but it's called a V lookup. It's called a vertical lookup. Now I'm just going to zoom in on this so you can see what I'm talking about here. There is the formula there for a V lookup, right? Now, what it basically says is go and do a lookup vertically of the thing that's in B2, which is Tamika Hawke's name, and then go over to the class list and look in the range from A2 to D14 where the names are kept. And if you find the name Tamika Hawke, <coughs> put the thing that you find in the second column. Okay? So look up the thing in B2 from the class list, A2 to D14, and put the thing you find in column two. Don't worry about the word false at the end. Too hard to explain. Just trust me, you've got to put the word false in for it to work. Okay, now I've just done that for those three columns. And when I come out of that display mode there, you'll see what actually happens is if I switch to a different student now, like Perla Atwood, it goes and finds Perla's score. If I come in here and Lita Vales, I've got her scores. And so that's really easy. Now, this is also live. So if I was to grab all that data there and make a little click on this little chart button up here, which would generate a nice little chart for those students, right? And I'm, I could fiddle around with this chart and customize and everything. I'm just going to go with the, the, the way it looks there. Now, when I let's move this out of the way, actually, put it there. Right now, when I pick a different student, watch what happens. The chart changes depending on who I pick because it's actually pulling live data from the list that exists over on the other sheet. And all I'm doing here is giving myself a little drop down box. And from the drop down box, depending on what it finds, it goes and looks up the values for that student and puts them in those rows and then draws the graph for me. So you're going to see a much more interesting implementation of this, but I just want you to see this because otherwise it looks very confusing when you see it for the very first time. The last thing, which is the bonus point, 
and I'm just going to gloss over this, there's a thing called a spark line. If you're a spreadsheet nerd, you're going to want to check this out. If you're not, then just ignore everything I'm about to say for the next 20 seconds. I've hit it right here, right? This is called a spark line, and a spark line creates a little graph inside the cell of the spreadsheet. So you can see right here, this, this chart here, I can tell at a glance from, look. Oh, let's take the second student, Nicole McCool, right? She did pretty well for the first two tasks and then did really well for the last one. Her score came up. This student over here, this one here, uh, Natasha Johns, her, she's just been going down and down and down right, over those three tasks. So again, I'm able to do a little mini graph in each cell using this thing called a spark line. And again, let me just show you what that looks like without wanting to confuse you too much about it, is that's the formula there for a spark line. It says, make this little thing called a spark line by looking up the things over in the other column and then drawing a chart with a line, right? Now you've got to, you've got to write it with the correct syntax, the correct, um, you know, the correct way. But once you learn how to do that, you can do some really neat things. There's all sorts of variations on spark lines. If you're interested in learning more about spark lines, I've put a little uh, thing down the bottom there. And I think I've given you this sheet as well. If you'd like a copy of this sheet to play with, um, it is right there at bit.ly slash GFE underscore data basics. So I'll leave that up on the screen or maybe I'll paste that into the chat. Um, if I can get to the chat. Just did that for you, Chris. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so if you want to have a play with that, um, I'll just reset everything back to back to standard. So just hold off on taking a copy for just for a sec until I reset it all for you. But, um, yeah, that's uh, all there for you to play with, including uh, some more information about sparklines. I love the sparkline idea, but I, I will admit that I've always been scared of them. <laughs> they, look, they look so cool that I figure they have to be difficult. Uh, they're, they're not once you once you've done them once or twice. They're, they're actually pretty easy. Yeah, I found that with VLOOKUP. I used to think it was scary. Um, Chris, when I if I if I wanted to know about like something like VLOOKUP, right? Sure. Um, and I, you know, you had the formula on the screen before, which was great. But if I hit if I just go into a cell and I hit enter and then start typing V, can you just show everyone just in case they haven't right. seen that come up? Right, so when you're putting in a formula and you're not sure how to use a formula, so I'll give you an example, the sum one, right? If you know it's equal sum and you start to type that, it actually pops up this little box to step you through it and it's saying here's how you write it. You put sum and then you put your values in there. Here's an example. Here's a link to learn more. So every time you put a formula in, it will actually try and help you. And if you get a complicated formula like a spark line, let me just escape out of there, if I say like equals spark line, Right, and then um, if, I click, if, if you don't see these instructions pop up, by the way, just click the little uh, question mark on the side there and you'll get them. And, and here it will explain to you how to do a spark line. That's what you need to type in order to make one work. And if you want to learn more, click on the learn more button and it will open up another little panel here uh, eventually and it will give you some more instructions on how to do that. There you go. So there's the instructions on spark line. Spark line's a um, slightly more complicated one, but um, Honestly, once you've used it a couple of times, it's super easy and very useful for teachers to be able to get that at a glance look at what's happening across a range. This is only across three scores, but you know, if I had much many more scores uh, for a student, it would give me sort of this uh, this much more useful line. To give yeah, you and I love that formula help because, like, you know, I was looking at the V lookup one, and it's like tells me what the search key is and gives me an example. You know, like, because it doesn't just say you know, enter the search key, it literally tells you, you know, that extra info. So it helps you, it really is trying to coach you through using those formulas. You know, um, the, other thing, you know the other thing, simply just like, just some people don't realize that if you if you select a bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet like this, then down the bottom here, right down in the bottom corner here, it'll actually give you a little box that you can have a quick look at something without actually doing any formulas. So this is telling me the sum of all those numbers is 319. If I click the arrow, it's giving me, well, the average, average is 25. The minimum number in there was 11. The max was 35. There were 13 objects and so on. So, you know, sometimes if you just want a little quick snapshot, how many numbers in here altogether? Well, there are 39, right? So you don't always have to write a formula for everything. Sometimes if you just need that one piece of information, just that's enough. Uh, that, and when I learned that, which I will admit is in the last few years, like I was like, oh, my gosh, amazing, life-changing. So if you if you have colleagues that wouldn't know that, show them that and they'll instantly like spreadsheets a whole lot more. 
Um, okay, um, Chris, I would like to jump across. If anyone wants to ask questions, please feel free to. I will look up some support articles um, and drop a few things in the chat as well. And there is that link to Chris's sheet in the chat also. Um, but Chris, I think I'd like to jump across and hear from one of our special guest nets if we want. Do you Ooh. want to introduce Mitchell? Sure, sure. Um, Mitchell, I'm bringing your camera up. Hey, Chris. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you, mate. Good. Um, I'm also joined by um, Jason Clinton, who's our relieving principal. It's gonna... Hello, Jason. It's great you could be here today. G'day, Chris. So uh, I first met Mitch when he applied for the... Well, actually, I don't know when I first met you, Mitch, but it was you you, be, you went to the Innovator Academy and became a Google Certified Innovator. And then yep. um, at some point beyond the track from that, we we're talking about the great things your school is doing. And um, uh, we got your school involved in the reference school program, which is basically uh, you know identifying schools around the countryside that are doing some pretty cool things with Google technologies. So um, remember we had some conversations with Jez at the time uh, and, uh, and, and you guys really uh, jumped onto this idea of using data effectively within the school. So I'll hand over to you if you want to uh, share your screen or- Yeah, I'm just stop sharing. Um, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Uh, awesome, can you guys see our screen now? Yes, we, we can. can, yes. Excellent. So um, we just want to talk through our journey and tell you um, what we've done with assessment and reporting and, and the tools that we're using to help us along the way. So um, our starting point was to create whole school collaboration and con a consistent approach to the delivery of assessment. So um, the way in which we did that was we um, created a shared drive across the school that everyone has access to, that everyone can collaborate with. Um, from there, we had a clear plan of how and what we wanted to assess across the school and we really wanted to be intentional about our assessments and our types of assessments. And um, we developed, you know, consistent assessment overviews using like just Google Docs, but um, creating a template that's consistent K to six so that every teacher knows what it looks like and, and can um, clearly know when we're assessing things across our school. So um, kind of combining that with, with calendars and different things has, has enabled us to monitor and track our assessments across our school, as well as giving our executive staff and our principal complete overview of what's happening in, in the school at any time. Um, the other things that, that we've kind of created is just a consistent teacher judgment for awarding grades for, the, for reports. So we, we've just used some Google tools um, to help us and assist us with that. Some of the examples are, here's just our assessment overview. And we've just tried to make that interactive as possible so that um, assessments that are online or, or assessments that are quizzes that, that teachers can just go in and, and click on them and they'll, they'll find what they need to save them time. So, you know, um, some of the assessments are um, the, the link to the rubric so they can um, add that to Google Classroom and away they go. Or it might just be a, a quick form so that um, everything's brought online and that we can have that consistency across the school. So that, that's just our, our process with our assessment overview and our schedules. Our consistent teacher judgment is just giving our teachers the tools to effectively grade um, our students, which then um, plays into the reports that we're writing for our students. So there's just some examples of those tools as well as um, we're using uh, Markbook on Google Classroom and using those online quizzes to, to do the assessment tasks in a self-mask and just to save teachers time instead of going home and marking assessments for hours. It's, it's all online and um, automated for them. Uh, one tool which we're pretty proud of which is our assessment tracker. So um, Chris actually helped us with one of these um, templates that we'll show you and we're happy to share with any school, but our assessment tracker was developed uh, about three years ago and it, its whole goal of purpose was to monitor students' growth in reading across our school and across their lifetime at, at, in their K-6 to education so that we can clearly monitor their growth and see um, any trends or any data so that we can um, implement strategies if students are struggling or also implement strategies if students are succeeding and, and extend our students. So it's, it's a database of just uh, um, a spreadsheet which um, we've developed over time and it clearly just shows a quick snapshot of, of students reading graphs so it's just a simple template that's used across k to six uh, student names and then each 
um, snapshot of learning with, with their reading level is, is captured and then it just gives us a visual rep representation. So um, for the classroom teacher, they can clearly see the students' growth throughout the year, but someone like the principal, they can go in and, and monitor and see which, which classes they need to provide extra support to or um, can get updates on students to celebrate. So um, the other things that we're tracking across our school is just a, a writing growth analysis. So in there we can see the growth of the students with their writing um, through their two assessment tasks throughout the year. And um, I might go over to Jason about how useful our assessment tracker has been when we're in COVID. Yeah, so I was dropped into this role at the start of this year as relieving principal. Um, and as you know, COVID threw up many challenges for schools, but one of my first jobs this year was, uh, if you're a New South Wales school, you would know is we have to uh, report to the community and to the department uh, around the annual school report. And last year, uh, NAPLAN uh, wasn't administered in New South Wales, so we didn't have that little suite of uh, data to use for our whole school assessment and reporting. Uh, to the community and to the department. Um, so really the, the Google tools that we were using um, actually saved me <laughs> in that process of how can I get data from kindergarten to year six. I uh, remembering that plan only really reports on year three and year five, but by using the uh, tracking tools that we'd used across the school, I could then pull that information um, from a, from across kindergarten to year six to see how our kids how many kids were achieving at benchmark, uh, how many were above, and it was real time data that I could use to report on how the school was achieving its priorities in in the school plan. Um, so I don't know where we would have been without that. Um, Different grades in the past, different grades um, and stages had used uh, various different assessment models, um, but just to be able to go to our assessment tracker and pull the same data from across the school just gave me a consistent um, data source, I suppose, that I could use to accurately report um, on our school's progress and achievement, particularly in the area of reading. Um, which was the one I really focused in on reporting to parents and to the department. But that was really effective and really efficient um, in getting that information for someone in my executive position uh, to be able to report on. That's, I'm so pleased to hear that. And, and I know uh, at your school there, I mean, literacy is important for everyone, obviously, but uh, you have a very high Indigenous population at the school as well. So I guess it's a particularly important focus for you guys. That's right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. That's great. Can I ask a question? I know that we didn't we didn't preempt this, so sorry for putting you on the spot. But I guess I'm I'm interested to know like where do you like what do you see the next step is for the school? Because obviously you've come on this journey, like Mitch was saying, you know, it's three years or so of getting to this point. I imagine, you know, there was a lot of change management strategy that went in place to get everybody on board the idea of using the consistent trackers, all of that. Um, but it sounds like you're in a really great place now. And so I guess I'm wondering what do you see as the next step for, you know, in this sort of data collection and use for the school? I think just continue to consolidate what we have and then slowly implement more things that we can gather data on and continue to monitor, monitor student growth in, in some other areas. You know, I would really like to see some numeracy um, data that we're, we're capturing across the school so that we're, we're kind of backing that up as well. So that'd probably be my thing. Yeah, and also we're not only using it for student data, but we're using it for like community data as well. Like, and especially when it comes around in my job, um, getting information of parents of their priorities. Mm. Um, Mitch, you know, sends out those Google Forms. We use those a lot now just to gauge where our community is sitting and what their understanding is of around school and what we're doing here. So, um, yeah, the opportunities are endless, really. It's great to hear. And I love the fact that, um, you know, I think you highlighted such an important point that it doesn't have to be complex. Like, you know, you know just being able to gauge you know, the mood of the meeting, you know, how's the community feeling in something really simple and easy um, can be really powerful as well. So it's not, you know, you, you're, you're suddenly moving from having to just rely on anecdotal um, experience to having data to support 
I guess, you know, what the next step is for the school and all kinds of different strategy. That's right. Awesome. Right. Well, we're going to go from, I mean, and I think the, the beauty of what I see you guys doing is it's it's so achievable by by schools, you know, like it, it's, it's shared spreadsheets. It's a shared drive folder. And it's simply by getting it set up the right way and inviting, you know, your teachers to participate in that. It's a really simple and easy way of collecting that data and doing something with it. So we're going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to talk to Murray Bridge. Now, Murray Bridge are doing some really interesting things with their data as well. So um, where I can't see you on the screen. Jason. Here. Jason. Uh... He's just popped out to get a coffee. <laughs> yeah, he's in the goal still, Jason. Jason, are you there? Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, yep. So, Kimberly, you, uh, you work more closely with uh, Murray Bridge than I do, so I might get you to introduce what's going on there. Sure. So, yeah, Murray Bridge High School is uh, another one of our reference Google reference schools in South Australia, um, uh, about an hour out of Adelaide. Uh, interesting, just from your quick reference to uh, some of the demographics at Gorik and uh, not totally dissimilar for Murray Bridge. Um, and uh, I've been really fortunate to work with a whole team of them out there um, and they're doing some really cool stuff in a whole range of different uh, areas. But I was in South Australia a few weeks ago, happened to be talking to Jason about something to do with data. And he was like, oh, I, I'm going to show you this spreadsheet. And then suddenly I was like, I need you to show everybody all of that. <laughs> so Jason, I'm going to hand over to you. Sure, thanks, Kimberly. Um, so yeah, so like Kimberly was just saying, so we're a school here about 1,100 students, 130 staff. And we've used Google Workspace pretty extensively since 2018. So really tight integration of classroom um, with our timetabling systems and things like that. One-to-one -one program of the Chromebooks. And this year we've now started all staff have Chromebooks as their primary device. Um, so we've also got six main feeder um, department schools here, which we um, real, there's a real focus on continuity of learning with them at the moment as well. And that's where a lot of this is coming from, especially with coming up to next year in South Australia a double intake and things like that. Um, Just for those who don't know, South Australia is aligning with the rest of the country and uh, year sevens will be in high school. Yes, thanks for aligning <laughs> with everyone else. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> um, so yeah, so a lot of our, being such a large site, a lot of our data is inputted into a managed database system. Um, but the question always comes up, how do we make this data valuable for tracking, planning, validation and measurability. Um, so obviously not all schools are like us, someone that can manage all this assessment items, what's coming up for each subject, what teachers need to input. Um, so you've also got um, an example here that I've done for a smaller school we're working on currently with them um, on their recording so of data. So their leadership came up to me in the holidays and said, we, just, we still keep pieces of paper everywhere with all of our information. Um, and I said, okay, you need to plan your outcomes. What do you want to know from this? Um, and also the importance of every record for a student having a unique identifier. Um, so I will just jump across to this one, um, which is a pretty basic spreadsheet essentially, um, using things like the conditional formatting tools that Chris spoke about earlier. So they have their current class lists and they want somewhere to record their semester one and two um, results for each student and ongoing tracking. Um, so things like if that student was to fail, the conditional formatting should change it to a red um, and calculating GPAs and things like that. Um, jump in if I'm going too fast at all with anything, Kim and Chris. Um, and then they wanna see that progress of a student. So we're using a more advanced version of, so looking up, um, that data that we've um, got on the other sheet and putting it into a summary table there for each student. So straight away, a teacher can track that progress over time. Um, so that's actually using an, what's called an index match formula and um, things like their, re their reading records. So they could have this being inputted with a form and then straight away, I'm using things like a query function to add that data to this um, student summary. So this is like the you're building on this, right, Jason? So and I just yeah. I did see when you were clicked into that index record the length of that formula. Yeah, yep. 
So, uh, it's yeah, there's some pretty massive ones in some of these spreadsheets that we've done over time. But this is all being stuff that's built up. I've built up from the real basic stuff. So, I mean, I'm going to go into our basic stuff that where we started here um, over time. And just as you realise more and more potential of the tools um, and that nature of it, um, more and more what can do and the insights that teachers can get into their data. Um, can I ask about the three different, oh, sorry, no, you keep going, then I'll ask questions afterwards. Keep going. Yeah, no, you go. Oh, no, I was going to ask about using the three different chart types on that page. Like, I'm assuming it's a very deliberate decision to have them charted differently. Um, really, this is just a um, in work progress. So it's sort of um, demonstrating to the staff, I got a demonstration with the staff there on Monday of the different types of data. So one is comparing the different subject areas. Another one is that reading level and then another is their gpa so a summary of all of their results jason is it possible just to uh show how that drop down of the students names work can you do that without exposing student data or i'm um, not on this one sorry okay. chris sorry. yeah i've got that i've got that later on on another yeah, one good um so yeah so as the feedback from a teacher there it's um that central location that they haven't had in the past teachers have had the pieces of paper um and I just want to be, you know, they can go to that central spot, exactly what Mitch and um, was saying before, the principal can pull up that data, um, which she hasn't in the past, and meetings with her education director and things like that. Um, so the next one, next example is um, where we do a lot of ad hoc projects and different things. We've got different targets on our school improvement plan um, and how we're going to measure that and the achievement that's happening with things like intervention measures and things like that. Um, so whenever someone comes to me with wanting to record something, um, we want to know what their outcome is first. Um, what do you actually want to know from this data? It's one thing to put it in, one thing to make all these pretty graphs and things like that, but what is that final outcome? Um, and also one thing that I am a big advocate for is ensuring everything's got that unique identifier. So we want to see a tracking of a student over time make sure you've got their ID number in that data. Or for us, it's their username as well. If it's something from um, forms, for example. Um, so I'll just jump across to this one quickly here. So this is, for example, a writing achievement. So they're moderating writing samples for a goal of our site improvement plan and um, adding where on a continuum each student is for a different area of focus. Um, so that's all just one basic spreadsheet there. The data validation, that Chris was showing earlier um, to pick the level. And then we've got straight away a student report. So this is actually using a H lookup, same as a V lookup um, to the rubric. So we can see in sample one, this student had these levels and it means this from the rubric. In sample two, these levels, it means this from the rubric. And then beginning to compare um, the different focus areas of where they've achieved. Um, so that's one that's been used quite a lot in our global perspectives area this year. Um. And I think, I think, like, it's just worth pointing out because I think people see that people who are not big spreadsheet nerds like you and I, right, see those pages of data. And I think, if you can, you just go back to the one you just had on the screen there. You know, I think a lot of us are used to having a spreadsheet like this and going into each of those cells and typing that information in. And I think yeah. what might yep. not be obvious to people here is that's all being pulled automatically from another data set somewhere else. And as you're going in and choosing different students or different views of this using drop down lists, it's actually completely restructuring what you saw on that page automatically. Yep. So we can, uh, so, no, maybe not. Um, let's go to. So straight away, we can see that's pulled the different levels from the records tab and yeah. the descriptor for that level from the rubric tab here. Yeah, that's the time saving feature. The fact that you're not actually making any of these sheets manually, that, everything's yep. been done automatically. Yep. Um, and again, then we can just go in and say, okay, what is that class? How have they gone in each of the areas? Because each student is tagged with their class code as well. Um, so traditionally we had a document that was emailed to all staff with their different um so we have a eight cycle reporting period a feedback at the middle of the term end of the term uh, middle of the term is what's called a traffic light so that's a student progress 
Um, traditionally, that was a sheet emailed to staff, um, but now that's been put into a Google Sheet that's increased the ability for any staff to analyze data. Um, and basically, I'm um, using all the tools that Chris spoke about before, conditional formatting, um, data validation for input and VLOOKUP to uh, get that target group information. So, you know, assessment software, for example, it may not have the students tagged as an Aboriginal group or a site improvement plan target group. Um, so if I just jump across to this one here, um, are we tight on time as well, guys, or? Couple of minutes. Yep, yep. Uh, so this one again is exactly what Chris was saying before with the conditional formatting. Again, straight away, that's that visual um, that Mitch was showing as well with the, how the students were going. Um, the real um, big part of this is what we've called a dynamic analysis tool. Um, so comparing any data set, any faculty, any subject uh, to anything, basically. So using a combination of B lookups, count ifs, average ifs, um, really using those count features um, with a um, criteria. So for example, we could say we want to compare 2020, Uh, 2020 SEM2. And we, but we want to see, okay, we want to see the Haas in year nine, but now we want to compare all students to the Aboriginal cohort. And that graph's changing straight away on the side there. Um, again, individual student progress as well so we're comparing a student against a target group against their year level or a cohort progress so averaging out and things like that seeing what is happening in different subject areas for different target groups so aboriginal or SI improvement plan group um so yes yeah, so a bit of feedback on that that's obviously going with the site improvement still improvement plan targets and it's that filtered comparative and triangulated data analysis which has supported um aboriginal support programs and things like that and it highlights the need and exposes misconceptions related to the low achievement uh, for shared focus and for action. Uh, finally, the last one is the 2021 iteration, and that's where we have uh, started using Google Data Studio. Um, so at this stage, um, it is just a flat uh, sheet, so something that to the average person, what's that? What am I going to do with that? Um, and that is uh, then inputted into uh, Google Data Studio. Uh, so data inputs the same for the teachers, um, but the final product is something like this. So we could then go and pull up a student. And it's straight away that visualization for that, um, for that staff member. So showing the attendance data for the student and where they are ranked for that subject. Um, so that was our midterm reports going to our end of term one, and we might want to say, okay, to get, to progress through to year 12, you need to be passing your um, compulsories, and they're highlighted here, as well as down there. Um, again, also gives us our cohort tracker information. So again, we might want to uh, say, okay, how are we going in English? in year 10 and straight away that English faculty leader can see, okay, that's the progress of my students and what's going on. Um, so yeah, next step is actually we want to use that power of BigQuery and things to pull in that live data from our existing databases. A um, couple of last notes um, on a lot of this that we've done is design matters. So as I emphasized before, it's all about that backwards planning and planning of the intended outcome. Um, so we're going to be using a combination of forms and data studio for the collection of information about our incoming um, 450 students, um, all the different categories and things like that. And that's the planning of the form and how it's gonna be presented afterwards. So I think I've flown through all of that, but uh, there we go. 
it's amazing like it's it's genuinely i mean chris is chris is like lapping up every second of it uh because it's totally hitting the nail on the head and i think it's such a great thing you know we wanted to use it um the examples this is like the aspirational like where you know you just didn't happen overnight for murray bridge has been quite a journey and obviously a lot of work behind the scenes but i think you know what you said at the end then about that backwards planning so yeah think about what it is that you're wanting to achieve with the data and have that you know as your first point not not what 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 could i do just based on you know different things that are available but actually what am i hoping to achieve as a result of it it's pretty powerful so mm. um uh oh, jason you got your email address up there does that mean everyone can email you and say hey jason <laughs> can you help design some new spreadsheets for me <laughs> I think the easier. I think the last on the spot question was easier, Kimberly. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, I am conscious of the time and I uh, and uh, wanting to honour everyone's time. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jason and Mitchell, for sharing. Um, I think it's such always so wonderful to hear and see the real live examples of you know th this is the technology. You know, Chris and I feel very privileged to work with Google to you know bring these technologies to school, but. You know the technology itself is 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 only as good as how good you guys are at using it and it's so wonderful to see those really cool examples of it uh in reality um i did want to just share uh very quickly i'll just put them up on the screen for anybody who watches the recording so if um we these webinar series is happening um for anybody who wants to join uh now but um we know that in australia and anybody who watches from new zealand you are in a different situation but there's a lot of central um bodies that uh, manage the uh use of google workspace um and so if you have any specific questions um about um google in your particular jurisdiction um particularly if you're in the um departments of education in south australia victoria or new south wales um these are the key contact points um for you so um these teams will be able to help you know you on your journey or help direct you around things that they have uh, in place in the particular locations as well all right, um, Chris, did you want to say anything finally before I finish um, the recording? Uh, look, only, only that I, I love seeing all these examples of what's going on from both of our schools today and, and just the power of what's there. And I, I think I've heard people say things like, oh, Google Sheets is okay, but it's like it's, it's you know, it's not as powerful as, you know, some other product that they might know better. The point is you can do all of this stuff in Sheets. It's incredibly powerful and it's actually in many ways is more powerful because it's so web-based, because it all just connects. And and, and, while, and the other thing about spreadsheets is while people look at spreadsheets and think, oh, that's so confusing, I'm not sure if I could work that out. Just remember a lot of the things you're seeing here have been worked out a little bit, little bit by little bit over time. It's not something that someone magically just dreamt up one day and put into place. I heard someone say once that there's about 40,000 words in the English language, but most of us communicate daily using about 150 of them. So it's the same with spreadsheets. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff there you could know, but really, if you just know a little bit, you can do a lot. Um, so it's that kind of concept. So, you know, don't be put off the spreadsheet concept because they look difficult. Um, figure out what you want to do, figure out what data you need to tap into, uh, and there are generally ways to do it, just one bite at a time. Absolutely, and you don't have to have all the answers. That's I think that's what Google's job is to have all the answers, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So I don't think that's in the official um, mission statement for Google. All right, I am going to stop the recording. Please feel free to hang around if you are joining us live. If you are watching um, uh, the recording, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I will stop now.